God looks internal, man looks external. Man focuses on the external. And if we're all honest with ourselves, all of us in this room spend an enormous amount of time and energy and money on the external. But the sad reality is, is that people spend very, very little time on the intern. All right, 1 Samuel 16. Jeff did a great job last week. I appreciate him preaching to give me a Sunday off. But it's great to be back in the pulpit preaching again. And we're looking at 1 Samuel 16. And remember when Israel chose their first king, they didn't really involve God in the process in the sense that they thought that they knew who would make the best king. So who did they pick? Who was the guy that they picked? Do you remember his name? Okay, good. Saul was his name. They, they picked Saul. Saul was uh, from the tribe of Benjamin, and he was basically the best looking and the tallest. They were focused solely on the external. They were looking on the outside, and they thought, this guy has the look of a great leader. So we'll make him a great leader. And initially, he didn't do too bad. But, you know, we have chronicled over the last several months how he really made a lot of mistakes and things began to go south. Uh, And, in fact, it went so south that God said, I'm removing you from being king and I'm going to pick somebody else. And what we looked at, what we began to look at before the Christmas break was, is God is now choosing a man named David from the tribe, from the family of Jesse. Jesse, from the, uh, and, and that's going to be their next king. And so we see this uh, selection being made in verse number uh, 6 of 1 Samuel chapter 16. So Jesse has a lot of boys. And David is so low on the totem pole as far as the one that he thinks will be chosen that he doesn't even bring him in. He doesn't even bring him before Samuel. And even Samuel, uh, when he sees the oldest first, says, oh, that's got to be the guy. (laughs) Once again, because he's focused on the external. So what I'd like to do today is, I would like to talk about what does God look for when God picks out a leader? So this is now going to be God's pick, right? It's not going to be man's pick. It's going to be God's pick. So What does God look for when God's going to choose the one that's going to lead Israel, the one that's going to be eventually be their greatest king, David? So what is God looking for? And and the reason why I wanted to focus on that today is because I want all of us to get our minds kind of right in the sense that this what, what is important to God should be important to us. What God focuses on, as far as an individual is concerned, is what we should focus on. So what does God look? Why did he choose David? Well, the text doesn't, in a lot of ways, particularly say, but it kind of hints around it. And that's what I wanted to kind of focus on today, is these five things that God looks for when God picks a leader. Number one, the first thing is, he looks at the heart. So we'll begin reading in verse number six. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So when he, when he brought in his firstborn, when Jesse brought in Eliab before him, he said, Surely he's the guy. This is Samuel thinking, right? Surely he's the guy. But verse 7 says this, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's a very important verse, and we quote that all the time, and you've heard it before, maybe you didn't know it was in this particular uh, chapter, but he's saying, don't look solely on the external. God looks internal, man looks external. Man focuses on the external. And if we're all honest with ourselves, All of us in this room spend an enormous amount of time and energy and money on the external. Like I, sometimes I get these wacky uh, ideas, and so about I I don't know a year ago or so, I got this wacky idea that I wanted to bike across America. Cuckoo, right? (laughs) I've never biked across Kansas, much less America. So, 
I know they do that in June, and I've thought about signing up for it, and I'm like, man, that's a long time on a bike. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, but I got this, so, so what do I do when, when I get kind of this idea about what I want to do? Well, I go on the internet, and I research it like crazy, and so I, so you, when you, when you, Type into Google "bike across America." There's all kinds of stuff out there about what route you should take and when's the best time to go. And then you have these people that have actually done it, and they blogged it while they've done it. They've they've stopped every night and said, "This is how far I biked today, and this is what I saw." And so I got really fascinated with this one guy, and he kind of chronicled his journey. And then he got to the end of it. He biked clear across. He touched his tires in the uh, Pacific Ocean. He went all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. That's kind of the goal. And uh, so he, he, was, he was blogging about it, and, and he was talking about what are some things that stuck out to you about, you know, kind of going across the United States. And he goes, people are obsessed with their yards. <laughs> he says, everybody was always out working in their yards. Americans are obsessed with their yards. They're obsessed with how tall their grass is and, and their shrubbery. And he goes, Americans love that. Now, why do we as Americans love that? Because we care about perception. Like, we live in a subdivision. My wife and I and our, and our family lives in a subdivision. We have the worst yard in the subdivision. <laughs> and I am aware of that. And I actually spent good money this year to try to make the yard look better. Why, why is that a big deal to me? Because I care about how I look. We do it all the time, don't we? Did you ladies just get up today and look at yourself in the mirror and go, I'm good? <laughs> Your laugh says it all. We spent time today, didn't we? We took a shower, we cleaned our face up, and uh, I would say mostly women in the rooms put, put makeup on and, and uh, did their hair, and, and, and so there was an enormous amount of time spent on the external. I'm not saying it's not bad to do yard work, it's not bad to take care of the external, that's not, that's not the issue at all. Uh, but I do think that we be, can become obsessed with it by how much we spend on cosmetics and clothes because we want to look a certain way. And, and we, we go to the gym. And a lot of times the going to the gym is not for the purpose of staying in peak physical condition, but it's because we want to look a certain way. We, we want people to look at us and go, wow, look at that guy's muscles, or look at, look at how thin they are, or look at how trim they are. Or, or, and and this is, this is, we, we spend an enormous amount of time and energy focused on that. But the sad reality is, is that people spend very, very little time on the internal. Because we can't see that. But God sees it. Jesus said this in Luke 16, 15. He said to them, You are those who justify yourself before men, but God knows your heart. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So what Jesus is saying is, look, you put a lot of energy and effort into things that don't matter to God. And ultimately, if I die and who I stand before is God, that's ultimately what matters, is how God sees me, right? Not how man sees me. Looks can be incredibly deceiving, so much so that we place great value on and respect something that actually God may hate. So what, the, the thing that we need to remember when it comes to when God picks a leader, God doesn't look at the external. God looks at the heart. And Eliab, we're going to read in the next chapter, Eliab turns out to be the wrong choice. You know why? Because you know what we find out about him in the, in the next chapter? Because the, the next chapter is the story of David and Goliath. We find out that he's critical, jealous, and negative. This is all internal. And I'll just tell you this. If you pick somebody just based on the external, we're going to find out later, David was a good-looking guy. He was a good-looking young, he was a good-looking man. It's not like, okay, you got to pick the ugliest people. But can I just tell you this? Focus on not only your external, but your internal. How do we do that? Well, deal with bitterness, 
deal with anger. You know how amazingly unattractive sometimes a person who's bitter looks? They can be the most beautiful person in the world, but when they're angry and bitter and they spew hateful words, don't look attractive at all. Maybe you've had to live with one. See, this is the problem with American dating, is the number one criteria is how hot are they? Let me tell you something about hotness. It goes south real fast. I don't. Where's that guy? Huh? Where's that kid? The looks are, the looks are gone. In the sense that aging is something you can't stop. You can mask it. But the reality is, is that as we get older, our physical bodies may decay and we may get uglier externally. But I think as a child of God, one of the things that ought to happen to people is they ought to get more and more beautiful as they age. I'm going to tell you right now, my wife has never looked as beautiful to me as she looks today. I didn't say that to get, I'm just saying, <laughs> she's a beautiful woman. And not, not focus solely on the external, but on the internal. And when you grow in your relationship with Christ, when you cultivate that inner man, when you cultivate that inside, when you, when you spend time uh, with God and growing in your faith with God, and as you, as you age, there should be a beauty about you. There should be a joy about you because you've dealt with bitterness and you've dealt with resentment and there's not anger in your heart. And this is what's important to God. Is there anything worse than an old person who's angry? They're, they, they're just, they've been beaten down by life and they've just, yeah, they're getting older and the older they get, the angrier they get. And there, is there anything more beautiful than an older person that heart is filled with grace and love and joy? I love watching you all grow old. Because, and I mean that in the, in, the, in the greatest sense because many of you, no, you don't look like you did 20 years ago, but you're more beautiful today than you've ever been because your heart is more beautiful. And this is what God looks for. He looks at the heart. And so Samuel is reminded of that by God in verse number seven. So what happens? Verse 8, so Eliab's not the one. So verse 8 says, so Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Not the one either. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen him. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. So he's got eight boys. Uh, David's the eighth. He brings seven of them up here. Every one of them, God says, nope, 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 nope. So then what does he say? Verse 10, thus Jesse, or verse 11. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Now this is amazing to me because it means that he wasn't even thinking about bringing David. Because surely, you know, David's out watching the sheep. So surely, you know, he'll, he'll send somebody out there to get him because it's, it's not going well for the other seven. The other, I mean, no, no. So, so Samuel says, is, you got any more boys? And this is what he says. There remains yet the youngest. Now, this is amazing because I, I, I keep saying the word amazing. Apparently, everything's amazing today. Um, this is interesting because he doesn't even refer to him by his name. He goes, he doesn't say, oh, there's David. He just says, oh, well, there's the young one. There's the youngest. And there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So number two, what is God? When God picks a leader, one is he looks at the heart, not just the external, but more importantly, the heart. Two, he looks for the humble. He looks for the humble. A humble person is willing to do any job including being a shepherd. When Jesus 
the birth of Jesus was announced to the world, who did the angels come to first? The shepherds, right? Now, the, the story of Christmas is that Jesus reaches cross-culture. He reaches all kinds of people. So we see in the Christmas story, we see the shepherds who are the lowest of society, but then we also see the wise men who are the elites of society. And the, really the story of Christmas is, is that Jesus, the, the, the gospel and the message of Jesus is for all men, poor and rich, for those not so smart and the intellectual, that Jesus is for all men. That's really the story of of Christmas. So what we see here is, is that one of the characteristics that sticks out about David is he's humble. Why is humility an important characteristic when it comes to choosing a leader? Well, humble people will be open to criticism. So if I'm willing to do any job, if 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 I'm not above anything or above anybody, and working as a shepherd is really a, a position of humility, humble people will be open to correction. You get somebody in leadership who doesn't want to hear what you have to say, who's not open to correction, man, it's going to be miserable for everybody under him. But a humble person will be open to correction. They know that they don't have all the answers and will need to get counsel from others. Humble people are not bothered to do small tasks because any task for God is worth doing well. So when God looks to pick out a man, see, our culture uh, values pride, and our culture values uh, over uh, self-confidence, and our culture values kind of selling yourself. God values the humble man, the broken man, the man who's willing to do whatever God wants him to do, wherever God wants him to do it. So when God looks for a man that he wants to do a work for him, he chooses the humble. 1 Corinthians 1. Can I read just a passage for you out of 1 Corinthians 1? It talks about, uh, verse 26 says this, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things which are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. So when God chooses a leader, he looks for a humble man. And that's, we see the humility of David here in being willing to do a small task such as be a shepherd. Number three, the third thing God looks for is he looks for the faithful. He looks for the faithful. And there he is, it says, keeping the sheep. The Bible has a lot to say about this issue of faithfulness. Jesus said in, in Luke 16.10, He who is faithful in that which is least also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. One of the reasons, for example, like I, in this picture here, one of the people that's in this picture is Steve Tucker, who's sitting on the front row here. One of the reasons why that we hired Steve is because not only is he an exceptional Bible teacher, and he probably knows the Bible better than anybody on our staff, um, maybe him and Jeff can, are up for that. You know, I'm the dummy in the group. They start arguing Bible, and I'm like, mm, I, I think I have an appointment. at uh, Anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> They're very, very intelligent men, and Steve faithfully for 13, 14 years taught here and never got a dime. Faithfully served, faithfully served. I have a lot of respect for people like that. Just faithful, show up every Sunday, do their job. I'll never hire someone as a pastor who's not first working the church as a volunteer. Not particularly our church, but they're, they're, they're willing to do the task for nothing. 1 Corinthians 4.2 Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, Paul says this to Timothy. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. For And the things which you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. When God calls David, he finds him faithfully doing what he has been told to do. He is keeping the sheep. 
He is doing a dirty, lonely job, but he does it because he has, a, he has been assigned to do it. When we look for leaders, we look for intelligence and experience. When God looks for leaders, he looks for integrity and character. That's important. See, we look for competence, but I believe this. If you have a man of character, he will learn the job. If he's faithful, if he has character, if he has integrity, he will do it right. He will do whatever he has to do to make it right. A lot of times when you, you, if you have a lot of talent, it's easy to just rely on your talent. But if you have character, you'll work hard. You'll be faithful. You'll put one foot in front of the other, and then you'll find yourself at the end of the journey ahead of everybody else because you just stayed faithful to what God had called you to do. That's what God cares about. So if you want to be used by the Lord, let me encourage you to be faithful where you are. The best thing you can do is grow where you're planted. Allow God to develop your character, your integrity, your faithfulness, your sense of responsibility in the ordinary mundane events of life. Be ready and be reliable, for you never know when the call of God may come. He knows where you are. He knows how to find you. He knows how and when to open the right doors in your life. Just be faithful and walk with him. In his time, he will use you for his glory. Just be faithful. God saw David doing a good job caring for the sheep. What does the Bible say? Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Right? Are you with me, church? So you work at McDonald's flipping hamburgers. You be the best hamburger flipper in Topeka. You scrub floors at a school as a janitor. You you make your floors immaculate because you're doing it not for the praise of men, but for the glory of God. You teach in a school. You, you, You be the best teacher. You work the hardest. You sell cars. You be the best salesman. You do the best job you can. You work in the office. You work for security benefit or you work for the government. You know, Change the opinion of government workers. Right? You be, you be hardworking. And I'm not, I don't, that, don't take that statement wrong. But there is sometimes a perception, you know. There's just like, there's a perception about preachers. What's the perception? Uh, work one day a week. <laughs> it's true. It's not true that we work one day a week, (laughs) but the perception is true. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. So if you're a lay teacher here and you teach kids, young little kids, or you teach the toddlers, or you work in the nursery, man, do it to the best of your, be faithful, be reliable, be dependable, show up. I hear a lot of young preachers, man, I'm just... You know, I I want God to give me a big church. Well, let me tell you something. One, pastor in a big church maybe is not what you think it is. And two, just be faithful to, if two people show up and want to hear you preach, you just be faithful to preach God's word. We're so enamored with glory. Even in the ministry, we're so enamored with having the biggest and baddest and and being the most respected and people all over the country look up to us. And and we have a lot of guys who pastor in, in little tiny churches and they kind of despise their flock because this is where I'm stuck and they're bitter and angry. Man, just wherever God plants you, just serve to the best of your ability and let God do what he wants to do with your life. And if he wants to exalt you and put you in a position of authority, and, and where you have influence over thousands, then let him do that. But if he just wants to keep you small and pastor in a small group of people, just do that too. It's all right. When I started pastoring 20 years ago, everything I thought I wanted was nothing I, I really wanted. For, for so many years of my ministry, I tied my identity to the size of the church. Foolish. Foolish. 
It's like sometimes when you want the opposite, you get what you thought you wanted to begin with. So now every Sunday I wake up and I'm like, thank you God for giving me one more Sunday. They haven't fired me yet. They let me hang around for 20 years. Help me to just be faithful today. Faithful to your word. Faithful to the the flock that you have placed me over. I thought I wanted to be famous and God just wanted me to be faithful. I thought I wanted to change the world. And God just says, I just have a few people I want you to deal with. And man, it is a blessing. I, um, it's so funny, you know, because most of you know that I have a little part-time job with FedEx and I, I pick up deliveries at night. And... Uh, It's funny when people who don't know that I have the job see me in public because they're kind of like, did Pastor Mark get fired and he's working at FedEx now? (laughs) Like people don't go to the church anymore. So I I went into Academy Sports. This was Tuesday this week. I went into Academy Sports and uh, I was picking up a package at the front desk there and and one guy used to go to church here and he... He actually got saved here, and then he, now he lives in uh, Kansas City, and he's going to Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and he wants to be in ministry. He saw me, and man, you could see his wheels spinning, you know? And I like to just kind of leave people hanging. <laughs> so he's kind of looking at me, and he's like, man, he's in a fed. And so he, uh, so he checks out. I go out and get in my truck. He pulls his car, and he goes, everything good, Pastor Mark? I'm like, yes, I didn't go through the whole, I said, just, you know, trying to pay for my daughter's school bill, you know, anyway, just, and he said, he goes, you're still preaching, right? I said, every Sunday, or as long as they'll have me. He said, I want to thank you for preaching the gospel, because I got saved in your church, so please don't ever stop. I, I, I mean, I didn't know we had kind of that much an impact. I mean, I knew the kid came here, and I knew he made it. But it's just kind of neat to be a part of that. But, you, but that didn't happen in one revival meeting. That happened in just kind of faithfully walking through the Bible for year after year after year. And God worked on his heart, and he went to Sunday school class. And That's what I'm saying, where it's just like I had a part, and Steve had a part, and Jeff has a part, and, and you have a part, and, I have, and, and the worship team has a part, and we all have a part, and God's using us. And we're, so all, all he wants us to do is just be faithful where we're at. What do you do when you're out of time? Can I give you the last two real quick? Okay. Four, he looks for the obedient and the submissive. I want you to notice what happens in verse 11. Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes. So he sent and brought him in. Now, this is important. Uh, did I get, let's go back to four. So four is, he looks for the obedient and submissive. Now, I added the last one. That was not in the original. He looks for the obedient and the submissive. People that make good leaders are good followers. So here's the deal. They run out. Hey! Now, I, this is how I kind of play the thing out in my mind. Here comes this guy. He runs out and he says, Hey, your dad wants to see you. Now, if he's a typical teenager... Why does dad want to see me? I'm doing fine out here. I don't want to come in there. I mean, I got sheep to watch. Kind of getting an attitude maybe. But does, does David have that? When, when they come out and they say, hey, your dad wants you, what does he do? He comes in. He comes into the house. You say, that's not that big a deal. Yes, it is. If you have a teenage kid, yes, it is. He is obedient and submissive. You know who makes a bad leader? People that have to be in charge.
A man who makes a good leader is one who understands what it is to be a follower, who will submit to the authority figure in his life. Because if a man refuses to submit to the authority figures in his life, he will not be a good leader because he'll rule like a dictator. You know when I know that we've made a choice, we've made the right choice when we didn't pick somebody in leadership, when we don't pick them and they get mad. We made a good choice because they couldn't follow our leadership. What does God look for when he looks for a leader? He looks for obedient and submissive. And number five, he looks for people sensitive to the Holy Spirit. So what happens? So he gets in the room, and what does the Bible say about him? Now, he was, he was ruddy with blue eyes and good looking. So see, God can use all kinds, right? You don't have to be, oh man, that guy fell off the ugly tree and hit every branch on the way down. God can use him. <laughs> that, that, that's, he's good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. I love this line. God saw not David for what he was, but what he would be. He's the one. He's a little young. He's a little rough around the edges, but he's the one. So then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose and went to Ramah. Now, I just want to point this out real quick, and then we got to leave, okay? When Jesse and David's brothers are brought in. Now, at the first of the chapter, when, they're, when the brothers are brought in before Samuel, they are sanctified in verse number five. In other words, their sins are dealt with and they're made ready for worship. When David is brought in, there's no time to be sanctified, but he is ready nonetheless. David is a picture of the believer who keeps his heart in a state of readiness. He does not know when the Lord may call upon him, so he stays ready at all times. This is the person that God is looking for as well. And what I mean by that is, is that a walk with God should just be that. It should be a walk with God every day, as we sang about earlier, every hour, every minute of every day should be this walk with God so that when God calls me to do something, I don't got to get right to then do the thing for God because I already am right. Like in other words, I think a lot of people use church to get right with God, then Monday through Saturday, they live like Satan. It's like, man, I got to get to church because I got to get right. How about we just live right all the time? When, when uh, David came in, he was ready. They didn't have to do an offering. They didn't have to do a sacrifice. David was ready. That's the kind of people God uses. God uses people who walks with him. So if I'm walking with God, and God looks at me and says, hey, can you do something for He's not like, hey, where's Mark? But if I'm walking with God, God just looks at me and says, hey, you want to do something for me? Yeah. Okay, we're late. Did it help you today? Okay. Value, can I just tell you this? Value the things that God values. What does he value? He looks at your heart. He looks for the humble. He looks for the faithful. He looks for the obedient and submissive. And he looks for people sensitive to the Holy Spirit. who are just walking with Jesus every minute of every day. Thank you again for listening to our series on 1 Samuel with Pastor Mark Doss. If you have questions about today's message, please contact our church office at info at TopekaBaptist.org. Give us a call at 785-862-0988 or check us out online at www.topekabaptist.org.